Tesla Grad is a really, really good game, and I knew that as soon as I saw the title screen. It was hard not to immediately swoon over the hand-drawn animation and backgrounds that make up the game's art style, and the dark and foreboding music that, at the very least, tells you this game has ambition. Tesla Grad is a puzzle platform game released in 2013 for PC and for consoles in 2014 by developer Rain Games. The game tells the story of a young boy who is supposedly chosen as the one who must defeat a mad king. The game has no dialogue or text whatsoever, using scrolls, hieroglyphs, and elaborate puppet theater to recount the game's lore. Simply, this is the story of a young boy descended from a group of scientifically gifted wizard people who once helped a man fend off barbarians from a city. This man was then declared king, but he asked for the wizard's help to conquer other kingdoms, they refused, and in short, the Mad King wiped them out entirely, and now the only thing that remains with them is a gigantic tower and their ancient technology. It's a straightforward plot with no surprises, but some side characters offer some subtle emotion in their animation when on screen, giving depth to the plot. The game is very atmospheric, starting you off in a rainy city while jumping across rooftops and avoiding soldiers until you finally make your way into the wizard's tower, with excellent visuals and accompanying music that makes you feel vulnerable and afraid. I absolutely love that because you play as a child and because you are vulnerable to almost everything, you actually feel yourself becoming more confident as you progress like you're actually growing up in the game. The visuals are incredibly endearing, with cartoonish characters juxtaposed against slightly more realistic backgrounds. It's comparable to a game like Rayman Legends, but I feel that the art blended together much better in that game, while here it's much easier to identify the different layers of animation. There is an impressive variety of set pieces and designs for the game's mechanics, which is important in an open world game like this, where being able to remember locations based on how they look is a major plus. Little touches in the environment are really cute, and at one point a seemingly meaningless set of hieroglyphs actually tells you how to beat the first boss. One problem I do have is that the map system it shows you each of the rooms and the general area you're in, but you don't actually get to see where within a room you are, and only really, like, you're in that room, and it's not very zoomed in, and I just think the map was poorly designed. The game is a puzzle platformer at heart, with a fairly linear progression, but it's the kind of progression that slowly unlocks shortcuts to later sections, making the game a Metroid-style open world. You have a main tower room, which is pure vertical space, with doors leading off to more concentrated puzzle sections. The puzzle sections employ the use of some key items that you discover during your quest, most of which are based on the central concept of magnetism. Much like how portals orange and blue portals can be interchanged at will, so does, for the most part, the red and blue polarities for the magnetic objects in this game. Like charges repel, opposite charges attract, just like most of you learned in elementary school. This allows for levitation, wall clinging, platform launching, and various other variations on a very simple concept. You begin slowly with items that allow you to charge a surface's polarity, well, soon after you get an item that allows you to warp short distances. Well, midway through the game, you get a cloak that makes you magnetize yourself. That being said, I had a few problems controlling some of the mechanics because, well, you know. Fucking magnets. How do they work? The warp is extremely fast, and no matter how many times I used it, I could never really predict exactly how far it would launch me, often sending me into hazards and enemies. Oftentimes I would mess up because I forgot which button was the blue polarity and which one was the red, which sort of does the opposite thing it wants you to do. There's nothing more frustrating than getting to the last segment of a puzzle, only to attract yourself into a beam of lightning. Other times I would try to repel myself off a charged platform, but standing just slightly too far to one side would push me horizontally and not vertically. That is a very key difference. The repulsion and attraction physics never felt that consistent, and the hub area made those problems much more apparent. The largest area of the game, a vertical shaft that stretches upwards for dozens and dozens of screens, also serves as a makeshift hub with exits and entrances all along the walls to the other areas of the game. The whole shaft is filled with a blue levitation field which you can use to slowly ascend the tower. Maybe a bit too slowly. I'd often find myself jumping into the field only to have my gravitational momentum overpowering my magnetic powers, so I'd basically fall 100 feet before I made any movement upward. This is also the part where I bring up the game's frequent slowdown problems. The next few clips I'm showing you are not laggy capture, this is just how the game runs sometimes. This happens most often in the big tower room since there are so many different entrances it has to load, but it still happens in other places as well, and it happens enough that it started to bother me despite occurring when exiting and entering areas which wouldn't really interfere with the gameplay. You will be revisiting a lot of areas, as this is classified as a metroidvania style game, with backtracking mostly being for collecting bonus scrolls. Rather, I found that most of my exploration was spent figuring out where my current selection of powers would allow me to go next, which I think is a completely valid and engaging form of progression, so I didn't actually dislike it. The last thing of note about the game are its boss fights, which are best described as something pretty cool for the first few attempts, but only mildly satisfying upon beating them. Which, you know, is like... 30 attempts later. Since you operate on a one-hit health system, boss fights are generally grueling three-staged pattern fests. Except these patterns are impossible to learn on one try since you get killed after one hit. Boss designs can range from massive to small with lots of projectiles and they often take into account the design of the room. 
The final boss is probably my favorite, since its high difficulty is what I'd expect from a more gradual difficulty curve, unlike the bane of my existence that was the fight I am currently showing you. Bosses had projectiles that would just start in the same place every time, and unless you knew where that was going to start, you were probably going to die, or you maybe got lucky and you were on the other side, and that's just an incredibly frustrating mechanic that means you have to replay the same thing over and over, and the parts that aren't actually hard, you still have to replay them, and it takes up a lot of time, and it's just really frustrating. I, ugh. Personally, I wish that the game was a bit longer as I felt that one or two more upgrades would have made for an appropriate length as the game's only about six hours for me. But the game does end rather nicely with no large celebration, just a subtle and silent final scene to wrap up this rather delightful game. Teslagrad is engaging in both its gameplay and atmosphere, and the game is short enough that the frustrating moments don't keep you from finishing it. Go get a copy! And with that said, thank you for watching. If you want to see me play through a Smudgeup game, check it out here, or check out my review of Batman Arkham Origins. And finally, if you want to see me and my friends do some group Let's Play stuff, check out Nitrous Turtle, which we recently relaunched to be super awesome. Have a great day, and you can expect a lot more from me soon.